As many of you likely already know, George Lucas has always cited this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, as one of the major influences on his creation of the original Star Wars. I've been hearing about it myself since the 70s, but only just now gotten around to actually reading it. And uh, I must admit, it's inspired uh, this talk and uh, some interesting new thoughts. You may notice that even though I say the book helped with the creation of the original Star, uh, Star Wars, this is a later edition from the 80s where Luke Skywalker has actually joined the uh, pantheon of mythical gods here on the cover of the book. Where, so the circle's complete, right? The circle is now complete. <laughs> um, and well, there you go. You've heard about it. You've, you've heard it talked about. There it is. There it is. The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And let me get this straight. So you had some new thoughts on this topic on our recent trip to England. I did. I uh, Well, I hate to confess it, but uh, uh, my mind wandered a little bit while we were at church. And uh, But I guess I was in a meditative state, and it occurred to me that uh, while we were at the Oxford Oratory Church, where we attended uh, on the Sunday before Christmas, some new thoughts came to me connected with uh, this book and with some other things associated with the church itself. So we'll talk about that as we uh, as we go forward on this episode. All right. Well, I'm curious to hear about it, and I hope you guys will join us here at the discussion table while we talk about it. Hello again. I'm Jack. This is my dad, and welcome back once again to another episode of the Popcorn Cathedral. Well, I know maybe the first question you're asking is, Star Wars again? Is this a Star Wars channel? Well, we're, it's not actually a Star Wars channel, but uh, since we made the move from podcast to YouTube, uh, and we started off with our visit to the Star Wars Museum, and we appreciate the, those who watched those videos and responded, that we might stay on the Star Wars theme a little longer since it's a good, uh, a good jumping off. There's so many fans and a good, good way to segue into the uh, YouTube version. So Star Wars again for a little while. Uh, originally issued in 1949 and revised and reissued by Campbell in the 1960s, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces was an old book, but kind of new at the same time while George Lucas was in college where he discovered it. Uh, some of you may remember that George originally considered just studying anthropology in college rather than film. And uh, this book basically showed him eventually the way that he could combine the two. And that's kind of why this book is such a perfect bridge for that. It might be good to talk for a minute about some of these campus fads that, uh, that influenced George during his college days. You know, there's, uh, especially in the very idealistic campus culture of the 1960s, there was a lot of highfalutin or high-toned uh, 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 fads going around at that time, literary fads and, uh, and film and all the rest of it. Uh, and a lot of these, George, George was influenced by practically all of them. As a matter of fact, I've come to the conclusion that you can make a catalog of all of the big campus crazes of the mid-60s, and just about all of them were influences on Star Wars. Uh, I think about The Once and Future King by T.H. White, uh, kind of a hip, modern updating of the King Arthur story that some of you may be familiar with uh, as kids of Disney's Sword in the Stone, the basis of Disney's Sword in the Stone animated feature. Uh, but if you look at that film, and maybe if you think back on it, uh, the Star Wars influences can get pretty, uh, pretty clear. Uh, you may remember that uh, Luke Skywalker, the humble farm boy who has actually has a great background, a great destiny ahead of him, and a family heritage that's greater than anything he ever imagined, uh, is definitely part of the King Arthur story, part of, uh, part of Once and Future King. Uh, one of White's uh, uh, devices that isn't in the original Arthur legends is uh, Arthur's, at the teenage Arthur has boorish older brothers or cousins and uh, a kind of an uh, uncle who doesn't understand him. Uh, and everybody calls him Wart, if you remember from the Sword in the Stone uh, uh, film. 
Well, in most many Star Wars fans realize that in early versions of Star Wars, including scenes uh, on Mos Eisley or, or uh, Anchorhead in the original uh, Ashi Station, yeah, cuts that, yeah. cut scenes, uh, and also this is brought out very clearly in the great Star Wars radio drama, which I hope everybody's familiar so you're a big with. Fan of the radio drama, check the radio drama out. It's on right. YouTube. Definitely, uh, it's very much worth a listen. Luke's Tashi Station quote-unquote friends have a nasty nickname for him. They call him Wormy. And as you can see, it's not much much distance between Mort and Wormy. Uh, but, you know, Arthur, it turns out, is not just the boy that scrubs the floor. He's the right wise king of all England. And he doesn't realize it yet, but we find out in the course of the story. And, of course, we find that uh, Luke Skywalker, Wormy, is the son of the Chosen One and the last of the Jedi Knights. So, uh, And he's kept in the dark by his uh, boorish Uncle Owen. So uh, uh, very, very clear uh, connection to between Star Wars and what's in Future King. Also, another of the really great uh, 60s college fads was Dune by Frank Herbert. Uh, that's obviously a very uh, direct influence when it comes to Tatooine and uh, Sand People and all, all the rest of that. But also, uh, it also contains a uh, an interesting uh, religion, the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, basically nuns, space nuns, as it were, <laughs> and uh, their Taoist-inspired religion. So uh, uh, definitely another ingredient in the mix for George Lucas. George in the mid '60s uh, was exposed in his early years at film at the film film department of USC was exposed to the films of the great Japanese director Akira Kurosawa and uh, I think from that George picked up uh, you know an exotic new form of knighthood that was mostly unknown to Americans at the time and uh, he was able to use it to give kind of an Eastern spin to this story of uh, King Arthur and the the desert, uh, desert monks and all the rest of it. Uh, and of course, later on, we, we noticed the oriental sounding names. Yes, these guys wear, wear uh, habits like medieval friars, but their names are like Qui-Gon and, uh, and Obi-Wan, oriental sounding names. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, Joseph Campbell, the first edition of which, or not the first edition, but the second, the reissue, came out in 1965. And also another one of the pop anthropology fads of the 60s, a book called The Teachings of Don Juan by a man named Carlos Castaneda. Kind of, uh, again, a, kind of a pop anthropology hit of the 60s, uh, all about shamanism. So, uh, and that figured in later into the creation of Yoda. But then, most preeminently, probably the number one of these college literary fads, uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which was first released in the United States in 1965, uh, the Georgia's sophomore year in college. Now, some people might be surprised to hear me use this word pre preeminently, the number one influence, since George himself never really made the connection explicitly. Many people have talked about this and commented on it, but it's surprising how, uh, how silent George is on this particular topic. But then again, he is, he's also totally silent on what's in Future King, and we've already seen that the distance between Wart and Wormy is very, very short indeed. So I think in these cases, the influences are so direct that George is a little careful about pointing them out. Uh, you know, he's often, when you bring up these influences, people misunderstand sometimes. They think you're, you're making one of these dumb Star Wars ripped this off or ripped that off or whatever. Uh, you know, there's a very fine line between a homage and a tribute and an inspiration and a knockoff or all the way down to a ripoff or plagiarism. And nobody knows exactly where to put that borderline, but uh, my goodness, William Shakespeare, uh, uh, Practically every one of his great plays is a knockoff of some earlier inferior play on the uh, same topic by Christopher Marlowe or some of the other. Uh, so, Someone earlier, definitely. So if it's a if it's a knockoff or a, a borderline plagiarism, uh, George has got a, a long pedigree for that sort of thing. So, 
And I think we should go ahead and say, very frankly, that uh, that we're both pretty strongly in the uh, pro George camp in oh, things like this. Definitely, the, definitely uh, absolutely. The, you you hear a lot of nonsense talked, in our opinion, about George Lucas, but uh, uh, but we're going to stand up and defend him on this idea of uh, of plagiarism or rip off. Every great piece of literature has got very deep roots, so that's all we're talking about here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Some, one person has said uh, there's no such thing as originality. Like everything is based off of something else. I don't know that I go maybe quite that far, but it is it is interesting because there's there's so much influence goes into all sorts of new different things, and there's just no way to be totally original in the purest sense. So, what exactly did George learn from Joseph Campbell? Well, I think George was very taken with what Campbell describes as the mono myth. That is, a storyline that can be found in all across anthropology that repeats itself so often in uh, world folklore that it can almost be defined as the central myth of humanity recurring over and over and over again across all cultural or religious boundaries. So uh, that is the thing that seems to have stuck in George's mind and been very, very central in the creation of Star Wars. Here's Campbell's own summary. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Hmm. Well, Lucas realized that this arc was present in many of the influences we listed. Things that he already loved, including some of the ones that weren't so high or literary. So here's George. Well, when I did Star Wars, I did consciously set about to recreate myths and the classic mythological motifs, and I wanted to use those motifs to deal with issues that exist today. I was very interested in creating a modern myth to replace what I'd seen had been occupied by the Western. The Western was sort of a modern American mythology that helped to explain the mores and values and the ways things work in our society. It struck me that we had lost all that. A whole generation has grown up without fairy tales. You just didn't get them anymore, and that's the best stuff in the world. So Campbell, most of all, inspired Lucas with a desire to create a new mythology. But I think that this desire had another source also, which brings us back around to Professor Tolkien. You remember I said I felt that Lord of the Rings is one of the preeminent influences on Star Wars, though George never really acknowledges this. Uh, but the Tolkien influences on Star Wars have been noted by many people. Uh, you know, I mean, the basic storyline, an orphan boy inherits a magical object. He finds that his heritage is more interesting than he ever knew, and he winds up in a, making, taking a key role in a universe-wide battle of good versus evil. And so, you know, the basic underlying structure is the same. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of details too. Uh, remember, our heroes have uh, swords of power, which glow blue, if you'll remember. Right. And the uh, while the Balrog sword is red. Is red, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you may remember, too, that uh, uh, Bilbo digs his old hobbit sword out of an old wooden box yeah, from a yeah. previous adventure, and he gives it to Frodo. The new hero, the passing of the torch. And Obi-Wan digs Anakin's old lightsaber out of an old wooden box and gives it to Luke. But maybe the central Tolkien influence isn't located within Star Wars' narrative at all, but in the whole motivation behind Lord of the Rings, which George eventually came to share. And that is Tolkien's desire to create a mythology for England. Similar, as you can see, I'm sure, to Lucas's desire to create something to replace the American Western. Uh, one of Tolkien's biographers explained the idea this way. Tolkien expressed his desire to create a mythology for England. He had hinted at this during his undergraduate days when he was studying the Finnish Kalevala, a cycle of Finnish myths. 
Uh, I would that we have more of this left, he said, something of the same sort that belonged to the English. Now, it's a mistake to assume, as I think many people have done when encountering these quotes, that Tolkien thought that he'd actually achieved this ambition with Lord of the Rings, uh, though it does express some of his aspirations along these lines. But his conception apparently was even grander than Lord of the Rings, which is a difficult thing to imagine. But, uh, uh, but he never felt he'd actually achieved a mythology for England, which I think is kind of an important thing to point out here. But, uh, and that's echoed in another quote of, of Tolkien's. I think you've got it there, Jack. Right, let me pull it up here. Once upon a time, my crest has long since fallen, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, ranging from the large and cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story, the larger founded on the lesser in contact with the earth, the lesser drawing splendor from the vast backcloths, which I could dedicate simply to England, to my country. I would draw some of the great tales in fullness and leave many only placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycles should be linked to a majestic whole and yet leave scope for other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. So, uh, so Tolkien never felt that he'd actually achieved this, but I'll, I'll step in for a moment and say that I think if Lucas's ambition was simply to replace the Western in the minds of American kids, uh, I'd say he succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. <laughs> Because it is a, a thorough success it's in, on that, that in that level, in, in the same in that way that Westerns yeah, were yeah. So, so important. Did George Lucas get his own myth-making aspirations from Tolkien and Lord of the Rings? I think that's very likely, especially when uh, uh, you realize that the story of, about Tolkien's desire to create a national mythology was included in several of the early prefaces to Lord of the Rings probably the ones that George found. Uh, but that brings us to a few questions here at the end of this particular video, and that is, if Lucas got it from Tolkien, where did Tolkien get it from? And how does George Joseph Campbell and his power of myth come in at this point? Well, I'm gonna answer, or to propose that the answer is on display outside the Oratory Church in Oxford. And I'm going to show you a picture that Jack took uh, on that trip right now. Well, I'm not going to explain the picture in this video. You'll have to tune in again uh, next time. But uh, I hope you will and we'll continue. I'll continue to try to make my points about the Savior with a thousand faces. So we hope to see you next time. Until then, we hope that you would honor us with a like for this video, uh, especially if you want to see more uh, interesting Christian-based discussion of uh, genre topics. We're hoping the Popcorn Cathedral will become your go-to place for that. So, And if that's the case, if you feel that that might happen, then also hit the subscribe button. And uh, we will uh, be back next time to continue the story. So uh, thank you for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.